Welcome. Hey, we are about to begin. Thank you again for joining us this evening. Um, I am Latanya Jones. I'm with the Department of Records and Information Services. We are the agency that is home to the city's municipal archives and library. And without further ado, I'll introduce our commissioner, Pauline Toole. Hi, everyone. Good evening. Uh, I'm very happy to introduce Jeff Richman, whose latest book documents the marvelous engineering feat that is the Brooklyn Bridge. The bridge connects the city of New York to the city of Brooklyn, and it took 14 years to complete. Jeff is a former criminal defense attorney who has served as an historian at Greenwood Cemetery for 15 years. His work engaging volunteers and memorializing the Civil War soldiers are momentous. He is the author of five books, including Building the Brooklyn Bridge, the focus of tonight's program, his chronicle includes 253 images, many never seen before, includes several from the municipal archives collections, and he also used stereographs to create 3D images, which you can view with 3D glasses that come with the book. So without further ado, Jeff, you're on. Well, thank you very much, Pauline, and thank you very much to the Municipal Archives and New York City for this opportunity to share with the audience uh, some amazing images of the Brooklyn Bridge and some amazing images from the Municipal Archives that are included in this book. So I will now venture to share my screen. Building the Brooklyn Bridge, 1869 to 1883, an illustrated history with images in 3D. I have long been a fan of the Brooklyn Bridge, uh, going back probably to the 1970s, reading David McCullough's book, uh, which came out in 1972, The Great Bridge, and attending in 1983, the centennial of the bridge and the grand celebration of 100 years of the Brooklyn Bridge. And I was presented with an opportunity, which I thought was unique to bring together images of the bridge. And so here is my book, which of course is for sale in local bookstores, uh, Rizzoli and the Strand and Barnes and Noble and online. And in Brooklyn, the uh, community bookstore and Greenlight bookstores. Uh, and the book took about three years to write. And so let's get oriented. This is the story of the Brooklyn Bridge. This is a print from the Library of Congress. And so here we see the Brooklyn Bridge connecting what was then the largest city in America, New York, and the third largest city in America, Brooklyn, with Philadelphia being the second largest. Uh, you see New Jersey here. You see Broadway in Manhattan stretching up here with Trinity Church and St. Paul's Chapel. You see the uh, Borough Hall or City Hall at the time in Brooklyn. And then you see this big green area all the way at the top right, which was the undeveloped part of Brooklyn. And this was key to the Brooklyn Bridge and why it was so attractive. The idea being that most people felt that Manhattan had been as developed as it ever could be. This was before anybody really conceived of the opportunity for Manhattan to go up with steel cage construction. And so Manhattan was considered full. And where was it going to grow? Where were people going to live? And the answer to that was Brooklyn, so long as there was reliable transportation between the two cities across the East River. And so the bridge quickly became uh, known as the eighth wonder of the world. This is a token from 1889, the 100th anniversary of George Washington's inauguration as president. And on the back of the token, the Brooklyn Bridge, only six years old at the time, uh, winds up as the eighth wonder of the world. And the bridge quick beca quickly became associated with all sorts of advertising opportunities. This is for spool cotton. And you see how they have incorporated all sorts of spool cotton uh, imagery into the bridge. The masterwork was, of course, David McCullough's book, uh, The Great Bridge. 
uh, which I relied on heavily for the information, but also relied on other sources, uh, much original material. So there are three primary people involved in the construction of the bridge. One is John A. Roebling. Second is his son, Washington Roebling. And third is his daughter-in-law, Emily Roebling. And so more about them shortly. And so here is my book, An Illustrated History with Images in 3D. Uh, I have been a fan of stereo views or stereoscopic views for 40 years and wanted to incorporate them into this book. And so here is the outline of the book as it proceeds. I was fortunate to get Richard Haw, who is the biographer of John Roebling, to write an introduction. And then Erica Wagner, who is the biographer of Washington Roebling, also to write an introductory piece about her love story, her love affair with the Brooklyn Bridge. And then you see how the book develops through engineers and workers, and then the various stages of the bridge, starting with 1869 construction and ending <clears throat> on May 24th, 1883, with the opening of the bridge. And so let's proceed through that, the various chapters of the book that tell the story of the bridge's construction. Here we see the engineers with a uh, John Roebling here, the father, Washington Roebling, the son, and then a drawing that Washington, uh, that John Roebling did in 1857 for a proposed bridge that would have gone pretty close to where the 59th Street Bridge is today. And so the chief engineers, John and Washington, and here is John Roebling. So John Roebling, born and raised in Germany, in Saxony, uh, Mulhausen was the uh, town that he and generations of Roeblings before him had lived in. He was trained in Germany as an engineer and architect. He studied philosophy with Hegel, uh, who by some accounts, uh, John Roebling was Hegel's favorite student. Uh, John Roebling felt that Germany had no future for him that there was too much bureaucracy, that he could not get anything done, that America was the land of opportunity. So he, leading a group of people, fled Germany uh, somewhat secretly because he was trained and the German authorities would not have looked kindly on him taking his knowledge out of the country, and went to Pennsylvania to become a farmer. And he and his brother purchased thousands of acres in Western Germany, not far from Pittsburgh, and he declared himself a farmer. Uh, of course, he had never farmed before. And after about a year of farming, he realized that farming was not for him. It was not sufficiently challenging for him. And so he left the farming primarily to his wife and became a wire rope manufacturer and a surveyor. Uh, this was a new technology in America. Uh, he had read about it in European journals and started to create wire ropes in the little town of Saxonburg that he and his brother had founded. Uh, he then became, using wire rope, a suspension bridge builder. Oops. And so John A. Roebling and Sons became the largest wire rope manufacturer in the world. Uh, they were manufacturing rope for elevators, for bridges, for all sorts of things that were arising as possibilities in the late 19th and early 20th century. And it was a huge enterprise primarily uh, centered in Trenton, New Jersey. And then this is Washington Roebling who became the chief engineer upon his father's tragic death. And so we'll discuss that uh, momentarily Washington Roebling was an RPI graduate, so RPI Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute, where he studied engineering up in Troy, New York. Uh, if you wanted to study engineering, you had two opportunities in America, West Point and RPI. And so civil engineering, you had to go to RPI, which is what he did. Uh, it was not a good experience for him, but he became very skilled 
as an engineer, and he would spend his summers in college helping his father build these pioneering suspension bridges across the Niagara Gorge, across uh, in Pittsburgh, in Cincinnati, across the Ohio River. And he also was a Civil War veteran by the time of the Brooklyn Bridge uh, being built. Uh, early in the Civil War, April of 1861, his father had looked at him over dinner and said, I think it's time for you to take your legs out from underneath my dinner table and go join the Union cause. And he had enlisted as a private and was promoted up through the ranks to ultimately Lieutenant Colonel. And he was something of a zealot of the Civil War in that he was at crucial moments in the war, including on Little Round Top at Gettysburg. He was a key to the defense of that hill, which became in turn a key to the survival of the Union Army at Gettysburg. He was also the chief engineer in waiting. Uh, there had been really no discussion in 1867 of who would be the chief engineer. Uh, it was unanimous that it would be John Roebling, who had the experience that no other bridge builder in America had. But his son was kind of one and a half in command. Uh, uh, John wanted Washington to build the bridge and talked about that. And unfortunately, John Roebling, as the work began on the bridge, got himself killed and Washington Roebling took over as the chief engineer. And so this is Emily Roebling, who married uh, uh, Washington Roebling. She was uh, Emily Warren Roebling. Her brother was a general during the Civil War, Governor Warren. And that's how she met Washington Roebling. And uh, Washington Roebling was an aide to Governor Warren during the Civil War. So she went, she was not trained as an engineer, but she was uh, described as very good with mathematics and science and had an acute mind. And so when Washington Roebling was offered an opportunity to go to Europe, with John Roebling paying the freight, uh, she went with him to study the use of caissons. And I will describe caissons uh, shortly to you and explain to you why they were crucial to the construction of the bridge. When Washington Roebling became debilitated as a result of the bends, but more primarily as a result of really a nervous breakdown and exhaustion, he had pushed himself so much and felt such acute responsibility for everything on the construction of the bridge that he broke down physically. And so his mind was every bit as good as it had been, but he could not see very well. Uh, he could not tolerate conversation. And Emily became the liaison to the assistant engineers and also the contract uh, contractors. She was widely admired by the assistant engineers. There were six on the bridge. She led the first delegation to walk across the bridge as it was still under construction. And she had the honor at Washington Roebling's insistence of being the first to ride a carriage across the bridge as the construction was being completed. So crossing the East River, which of course uh, created the opportunity and the need for a Brooklyn Bridge. Uh, here is a view from 1750 from Brooklyn in, at the bottom in the foreground and Manhattan in the distance. You see the tip of Manhattan here. You see, I think, an early version of Trinity Church uh, up in here. Uh, and let's just go back. And so as early as the 18th century, it was important to get across the bridge. Of course, George Washington, during the Battle of Brooklyn, brought his troops uh, out of Brooklyn under cover of night to escape uh, a siege by the uh, British. And so even in the 18th century, they were before the steamboat, they were running horse powered steam uh, <coughs> ferries across the bridge, uh, across the East River. 
And one of the problems was that the East River in the 19th century would freeze. And so the ferries were not a reliable mode of transportation. They could not run when the uh, East River was frozen. And then people would try to walk to work from Brooklyn to Manhattan primarily, and would get stuck on ice flows as the river broke apart and people would die as a result. And so the solution was a suspension bridge. And so what is a suspension bridge? A suspension bridge, first of all, uh, to give you an idea of the status of John Roebling and Washington Roebling, this is a cover from 1879, excuse me, from an illustrated newspaper showing the great suspension bridges of the United States. And so you see four suspension bridges here. And the first one is a Roebling bridge and the second one is a Roebling bridge and the third one and the fourth one. So they really dominated uh, the business in the 19th century. And this is their first bridge that they worked on to together, the Niagara Bridge. 1851 to 1855, and you see it here crossing the gorge of the Niagara River. And this was a two-tiered bridge. And so it was the first suspension bridge on which heavy stock railroads could travel. And so it was two-tiered. The top tier was for the railroads and the bottom tier was for pedestrians and for carriages and was really quite a phenomenal development. Here is a stereo view of the bridge. And so a stereo view, stereo views, as I said, I've been collecting since about 1980. And I had quite a, I have quite a collection or had quite a collection, which I've since donated to the Greenwood Historic Fund for Greenwood Cemetery. And these are side-by-side -side images, slightly different uh, to allow for a 3D effect when seen through a viewer. And so the opportunity that presented itself was uh, with another collector who had 25 stereo views of the Brooklyn Bridge being built, many of which I had, despite decades of collecting, never seen before. And then a third collector who has a phenomenal collection, Jeff Krause, of uh, stereo views. And so I was able to get both of those other collectors to agree to allow me to use their images. And that's really what launched this book. And so then we created anaglyphs. So if any of you have your 3D glasses handy, uh, which do in fact come with each book, uh, with those glasses, you can see these images in 3D. And so these are, in fact, you scan the original stereo view, and then with software that is available free on the internet, you merge those two images into a single image, which has both uh, red and cyan features to it. And that tricks your mind with the glasses into believing that you're seeing in 3D, which is really quite special. I think there are 44 images in 3D in my book. Here's another 3D image. You can see really the red effect over here and some of the blue up in here of the anaglyph. And this is the lower level or the uh, carriage, the non-railroad level. And then the railroad would have been up in here. So this is Niagara. 1857 to 59, the Roeblings are in Pittsburgh and they are building this bridge this suspension bridge. And then 1856 to 1866, interrupted by the Civil War, the Cincinnati Covington Bridge across the Ohio River. Really, uh, it impresses visually as a mini version of the Brooklyn Bridge, uh, a single arch in the towers here, but many of the same principles that you would see in the Brooklyn Bridge on a smaller scale. And so here is a suspension bridge, a print by Currier and Ives, both of whom as uh, Greenwood Cemetery's historian, I must point out, are interred 
uh, at Greenwood? And what are the characteristics of a suspension bridge that we see here? We see towers, we see two towers of granite, of course, in the Brooklyn Bridge. These wonderful grand entrances, uh, which had their roots in what John Roebling had seen in Germany with stone walls surrounding his community. Uh, the towers, the purpose of the towers is to get the deck of the bridge high enough to allow the East River to remain a navigable waterway. And so the Roeblings had to deal with the federal government, which insisted that uh, uh, based on the plans of the bridge, this had to come up uh, a another five feet and Washington Roebling had to redesign uh, the bridge. Uh, I think I missed an image. So let me just explain that John Roebling in June of 1869 went with his son Washington and with William Payne, one of the assistant engineers who was on the Manhattan side. And they were surveying for the center line of the bridge. And John Roebling uh, was in the ferry slip over on the Brooklyn side, would have been right over here. And as a ferry was coming in, he jumped up onto the wooden piles of the slip, thinking that he was safely out of the way. And it turned out he was not. And his leg got caught between the piles and the ferry and was crushed. And within a matter of weeks, he died a very, very painful death of lockjaw. And that left Washington Roebling as the heir apparent to build the Brooklyn Bridge. So back to the idea of suspension bridge, what you have is on the Brooklyn Bridge, four cables, one here, two here, and one here, supporting the weight of the deck and all of the uh, items that'll come across the bridge. Then you have suspenders, which are straight up and down and come off the cables and from which you hang the deck of the bridge. And then you had other wires in here, which reinforced the bridge. Plus you had a system of metalwork that stiffened the bridge. And so some of you may be familiar with Galloping Gertie, that bridge out in the state of Washington that collapsed because it started to vibrate uh, rhythmically. And so the Roeblings were very conscientious about making the deck of the bridge strong and firm so that that would never happen. In addition, you also have on these suspension bridges, the anchorage, which you can just barely see over here. This is the New York anchorage, and then there would have been a Brooklyn anchorage. And this is the cables dipped down into the anchorage. And the anchorage is what holds the cables in place so that they can bear the tremendous weight of the bridge and the deck and all of the passengers and vehicles on it. So here uh, is a uh, better rendition of the 1857 uh, John Roebling's plan for an East River Bridge up across what's now Roosevelt Island. And here, oh, here we, uh, I was out of sequence. So here is uh, the ferry slip uh, where you see the tower, the Brooklyn Tower here. This is Brooklyn. Uh, this is the ferry terminal. And this is the area where John Roebling got his foot trapped in one of these uh, ferry slips and got uh, crushed against the pilings on the side here. Uh, and so the ferry really killed him. This is his uh, cemetery lot in Trenton. And Washington Roebling took over. Now, as I mentioned, Washington Roebling was really physically debilitated uh, and was pretty much confined to his home on Brooklyn Heights from which he supervised the construction of the bridge. Uh, it is miraculous that the bridge is standing all these years later and it was such a remarkable 
engineering accomplishment, yet Washington Roebling, the 14 years of the construction of the bridge from 1869 to 1883, never set foot on the bridge. And Emily Roebling, as I mentioned, was his emissary to the bridge. She would go out two or three times a day to communicate to the assistant engineers what needed to be done. So his accomplishment, he and his wife even were in Trenton for three years, uh, around 1872 to 1875, as he tried to get physically well. And by letter, uh, he supervised the construction of the bridge. Really extraordinary. So here we see some of the staff of the bridge up in 1872. They're up on one of the towers, the Brooklyn Tower. And you see this is actually numbered and coded. So number one is E.F. Farrington, the master mechanic. Number two is William Kingsley, uh, who was the superintendent, et cetera, et cetera. And so we do have some wonderful photographs, including this one, the trustees and staff in 1878. Uh, these, the trustees, this is Henry Cruz Murphy, who was the chairman of the trustees. And then we have uh, a number of the assistant engineers here, including William Payne, who had served with Washington Roebling during the Civil War. Uh, they were tremendously brave in their service. They would change out of their uniforms when they were stationed in Virginia into civilian garb and go out riding to create maps of what uh, was out there, uh, risking instant execution had they been captured as spies out of uniform. And so Payne is at Greenwood as is George McNulty, one of, uh, another of the six assistant engineers. Uh, one of these is Wilhelm Hildenbrand at the end of the line here, who did some miraculous drawings. He was the best draftsman of the assistant engineers and we'll see one of his drawings from the collection of the Municipal Archives uh, shortly. And so here is Colonel Payne's gravestone at Greenwood. And here is George McNulty's. Uh, George McNulty's grave was formerly unmarked. Uh, we salvaged some stones when the cemetery purchased a uh, stone yard just down the street on 25th Street in Brooklyn. And we've had, I've been running this unmarked grave project. And so with a stone that was left over, uh, we had this inscribed to George McNulty and it now marks his grave. Uh, McNulty thought so much of Washington Roebling that he named his son Washington McNulty. Uh, of the six engineers, one was hired to work for 30 days, a 30 day contract. Uh, McNulty had just graduated from the University of Virginia, and he applied for a job as an engineer on the bridge. Uh, he was uh, rejected, and then he just offered to uh, work without pay. And Washington Roebling thought so much of that that he hired him as an assistant engineer. Uh, each of the assistant engineers, whether they were on a 30-day contract or otherwise, worked the entire 14 years on the bridge. That's how dedicated they were to the cause. And so the workers, uh, there were hundreds, uh, several thousand workers who worked on the bridge. Uh, the pay was comparable to pay uh, in similar laborers work. Uh, the turnover of laborers was acute. And so when they were building uh, or working in the caisson on the Brooklyn side, there were about 300 men working and on any given week, 100 of the 300 would quit. So it was not uh, attractive work, particularly down in the mud and in the compressed air, but uh, there were always more men willing to give it a try. And so here we can see some of the faces of the men who built the Brooklyn Bridge. Many Civil War veterans, uh, many sailors who were used to being up high when the cables were being spun uh, many immigrants from Italy and Ireland and Germany. Uh, here we see uh, a half stereo view 
And so if any of you have your 3D glasses, this is really a uh, example of a photographer who knew what uh, he was doing uh, with interest in the foreground, interest in the middle ground and interest in the distance to give a wonderful 3D effect. Uh, workers working on the vaults that would become part of the approach. Uh, you had to get a gentle grade down to ground level, one that people and horses could climb. And so you had to extend out. The bridge extends over a mile from end to end, from terminal to terminal. And so here we are in 3D with the same image. And then the caissons. The caissons were really the foundation of the bridge. They were the first element of the bridge to be built. Uh, as I said, Washington and Emily had gone to Europe to study this technology, which had been in use for about 20 or 30 years in Europe. They were using it in mines. They were using it in bridge construction. And the idea was that you created this box, a huge wooden box that was open on the bottom and you used it as a space in which workers could go into and dig this box down into the ground. And this would become what the towers would be placed on. And so these boxes, these wooden boxes are still below the towers of the East River Bridge today. Of course, you wanted to get an idea of what you were going to encounter as you went down. And so this is boring for the foundations. They're taking samples to see what they're going to come across as they dig the caisson box down into the ground. And this is from the municipal archives, a just beautiful, beautiful drawing of what they expected to see in Brooklyn as they dug down. You can see smaller boulders and sand, sand, sand with much clay, sand and gravel, et cetera, at 33 feet, at 41 feet, 42 feet. And remember that for the caisson, this was this massive box, 168 feet long, 102 feet wide. David McCullough calculated that you could put four tennis courts on top of the caisson and still have room for more. And you're digging these down into the ground. And so given the mass of these, you might be hitting bedrock in chamber number one, but in chamber number six, you might still be on sand and you had to keep digging and getting this box to go down evenly and level. And so here, to the, of course, there was no caisson builder that you could go to. What they did was they hired Webb and Bell, who were shipbuilders uh, along the East River and first in Greenpoint and then on East 6th Street in Manhattan. And they built these out of timbers, out of sticks, 12 inches by 12 inches on ways. And so you see under figure two, this shows how they're gonna launch the caisson when it's completed down the ways into the East River. It's going to be pointed down and then it's going to right itself. Uh, Another bridge builder, James Eads out in St. Louis, uh, predicted that this would sink to the bottom of the East River instantaneously. That, of course, did not happen. They floated it down the East River and then built it up some more with more timber and then brought it into position in Brooklyn. And so here is Eckford Webb, shipbuilder, uh, buried at Greenwood Cemetery with a wonderful carving in granite in the 19th century, which was very unusual. Granite is a very hard substance. And then the back of his monument, uh, Eckford Webb, 1825 to 1893, an eminent shipbuilder and constructor of the caissons for the first Brooklyn suspension bridge. So his proudest accomplishment, uh, despite the fact that he had built some of the largest ships on the ocean was the caissons for the Brooklyn Bridge. So this gives you an idea of the caissons. Uh, they were kind of primitive and at the same time cutting edge. And they were key to the construction. You see uh, just above the foundation line down in here, 
the work chamber with uh, men working down here. Uh, they came in through an, an airlock. And so they are blowing through the shaft, one of the shafts that come down into the caisson, compressed air to keep water from the river out of the workspace to the extent possible. Uh, and one of the problems, of course, is that as you go deeper, there's more uh, mass of water pressing against the caisson and you need more compressed air. And that's where the bends created a problem. As they dug deeper and deeper, they needed more and more compressed air. And then workers leaving the space were getting the bends and several of them died from that. Several of them were incapacitated as a result. But you see a very, very clever uh, feature here of the caisson, which is these, whoops, which is these chambers here, the uh, water shafts filled with water. And then they had these scoops that would go down and there was a pool down at the bottom and these scoops would grab the debris and pull it out through the water so that the water maintained the compressed air inside the caisson. And then they would dump it on little carts that we'll see in a moment and dump it into the river and then dredge it out of the river at the appropriate time. They also had shafts that allowed them to get the concrete into the caisson when it came time to allow the caisson to stay where it was. And at the same time, they are stacking limestone and then granite stones, these blocks to make the tower and at the same time to weigh down the caisson so it's not bouncing around in the water. So here's an early drawing, I think by John Roebling. Uh, I think this is also from the municipal archives, uh, which was tremendously helpful and cooperative. Just a brief note on the municipal archives in the 1960s, an engineer working for New York City uh, wanted to find some uh, drawings and so he went to a warehouse underneath the Williamsburg Bridge and there found about 10,000 original drawings of the Brooklyn Bridge, many of which had been created by Washington Roebling. And that's the collection that is now at the Municipal Archives. And so much of that is absolutely unique. Uh, this is a uh, kind of combination center shaft here with access for the workers and at the same time that pool to allow the debris. So this was not ever acted upon except with the broad principles that Washington Roebling then adapted. This is much more, uh, this is Washington Roebling's drawing and you see much more of the final product here with the water shafts here and here with the air shafts here and here to allow the compressed air to be pumped in. And then with the supply shafts here and here to allow the uh, concrete to be brought in to fill the caisson. So here we have a uh, great photograph, I believe from the Museum of the City of New York by Silas Holmes, uh, who is also in an unmarked grave at Greenwood Cemetery and uh, we'll get his grave marked. Foundation of the New York Tower, 1872. And so it is often helpful to look in the distance on these photographs. And so you see here, this is the Brooklyn Tower, which was more advanced than the New York Tower. And this is the Fulton Ferry. Uh, where'd my cursor go? Whoops. You see to the right, this mansard roof, and that's the Fulton Ferry in Brooklyn. And so we know we're looking across the East River we see on this side, on the Manhattan side, the blocks that are gonna be part of the tower. We see that this is winter because of the snow here. And we see these little chimneys here. And then we see some writing here. And if we look closer at that writing, we see that it says air compressor house winter. And Erica Wagner, who wrote the biography of Washington Roebling as the world's expert on his handwriting, 
and she assures me that this is his handwriting. So this is the compressor house, the 19th century industrial machinery that sent the compressed air into the caissons. So here we are in the airlock, uh, keeping the compressed air inside. Uh, they would open up a valve to allow the compressed air in and to be caught up in here, and then to even out the pressure as the workers went into work. Uh, some of the illustrations we had to rely upon, not photographs and not drawings, but woodcuts. Uh, there was no technology at this point in the 19th century to reproduce photographs in newspapers. And so the woodcuts were used based on photographs or on observation. Uh, we know of, I know of no photographs that were taken inside the caisson, uh, which I believe is a function of the lighting in there and the working conditions and dragging a huge camera in there. So here they are breaking these boulders apart. Uh, Washington Roebling pioneered the idea of using black powder. Uh, these boulders were really torturing the schedule. They had to take a lot of time to break them apart. And so he decided that he would experiment. He took a revolver down into the caisson, fired a small charge, nothing bad happened, fired a bigger charge and ever bigger. And then they started just blowing these boulders apart with black powder. And that saved a probably years on the construction schedule. So here are men moving debris from one chamber to another. And here are men stirring the water shaft. So this is at the bottom of that shaft where that clamshell would have come down and scooped up. And they quickly learned that this material was congealing in this pool and the clamshell couldn't grab it. And so they had to pump water. You see at the lower left, they're pumping water into the pool and then mixing it. These men are doing nothing all day but mixing this pool to keep it sufficiently liquid that the clamshells could get in there. And so here is a, a beautiful drawing from RPI of John Roebling's idea of the dredgers in 1867. And here is a photograph of the clamshell buckets in operation. You see the two clamshells, one here and one here. And so these are gonna drop down and you see this fellow here. So I did have a engineer who uh, specialty was historic bridges and he consulted uh, on my book. And he explained to me uh, fascinatingly enough that this fellow here's job is to sit up there on a board and to signal to the steam engine operator who is operating the height of the clamshell when it was time to stop letting the clamshell drop or when it was time to pull the clamshell up. He would just wave and uh, the operator would know that it was time to stop pulling or time to start pulling. So here's a better view, a closer view of the clamshell bucket, uh, one of the little railroad cars that they would then dump the debris into the river and then uh, would dredge it out. We're looking now at the towers. So again, the towers are to get the deck of the bridge high enough above to allow ships to go underneath, particularly because, of course, the Brooklyn Navy Yard is up in this area. And so we're looking from New York to Brooklyn, Brooklyn again, more advanced earlier. Uh, and here's the uh, ferry terminal with the mansard roof. A drawing from the municipal archives uh, by John Roebling of his miraculous and signature towers. Other than his Cincinnati Bridge, nothing ever built in America like this for a bridge. We know the Manhattan Bridge, the Williamsburg Bridge, the George Washington Bridge, the Golden Gate Bridge, all are steel towers, which to my mind at least do not have the feel, the magnificence, the sense of entry uh, that this has. And you also see here a little bit of a detail. And if we zoom on that, you see that the artist here put this woman with her parasol in here for apparently no other reason than uh, 
because he could. Uh, here's a uh, Washington Roebling drawing of the tower of the Brooklyn Bridge, uh, one of the towers. Uh, I think this is from RPI. Uh, Municipal Archives also has a very, very similar drawing. And this is important because it shows from above the tower and it shows you that these areas were hollow, that the towers of the bridge are not solid stone because when you're an engineer, you can calculate that you don't need solid stone in there and it's less work and it's less money. So here we are, one of my favorite photographs uh, that I found as I put this book together of the tower rising on the New York side. And again, we can tell this is the New York side because if you look closely here, there's the Brooklyn Tower uh, having proceeded farther up into the sky. And what I love about this photograph is first of all, the photographer seems to have had an in with the bridge. And so he got all these workers and some of these uh, supervisor or trustee types to stand still and look at the camera. And he also got the workers to hang these granite stones uh, to make the photograph even more dramatic. Here we are, the Manhattan side, New York side, uh, some of the landmarks of Manhattan uh, circa late 1870s. And so we see uh, my pointer, unfortunately keeps disappearing on me. Here it is, uh, St. Paul's Chapel, the old shot tower by James Bogardus, the United States Post Office that opened in 1876, the New York Tribune building, uh, which was actually slightly taller than the Brooklyn Bridge, but you can see how the Brooklyn Bridge really uh, was tremendously massive compared to uh, what else was out there uh, in Manhattan. And so here again, three really, I think it is uh, wonderful 3D images of the bridge. Just beautifully uh, constructed photographs. And here we are in Brooklyn, looking from the Brooklyn Tower uh, south towards the open water at the top. So the anchorages, the anchorages, as I mentioned, were key to giving the cables a place where they would be grabbed and held in place so that they could accept the massive weight that would be on them. Uh, there was an anchorage in each of the ends. Uh, this is kind of a cutaway of what the anchorage looked like with a uh, anchor plate at the bottom to which anchor bars were attached. And then the cable, each of the four cables had its own uh, set up like this. And then you had the weight of stone that held this in place. So here, this gives you a perspective. Here's the New York anchorage being built, uh, the New York Tower, the Brooklyn Tower, uh, and the cables are gonna come down, loop down this way, and then be anchored into the anchorage. So here we see a wonderful image of the four anchor plates. Uh, at one of the anchorages, uh, these kind of uh, starfish effects. And then you're gonna slide a uh, anchor bar in here and pin it and it's gonna rise up. So here we are in 3D and the anchor bars starting to rise and be surrounded by stones in 3D and then the footbridge and the cradles. So this footbridge is this construction here. These are oak slats. Uh, separated so that the wind would not take this thing very much. And this was just temporary to allow the workers to access these cradles so that they could monitor the spinning of the cables. And so we'll get to the cables in a moment. The cables were spun in place, wire after wire pulled across from Brooklyn to Manhattan, from Brooklyn to Manhattan. So here we see the cradles between the towers, three of the cradles, then there were two more to the outside of this photograph. 
And then here, uh, if you do have 3D glasses, I think this is probably the most spectacular of the 3D images. If you rock back and forth, uh, it literally moves with you. So we're looking down the footbridge. And then, uh, so here you see uh, the cable is being spun. Where is my pointer? Cable is being spun just uh, at the man's head. And he is checking to make sure that the tension on each of the wires is the same and that each of the wires is what they were called doing its job. And so each cable is composed of 19 strands. Each strand is composed of 254 wires and each wire is roughly the thickness of a pencil. And they are pulling these wires back and forth and ultimately wrapping them together to form a cable. So here we see the uh, footbridge with a sign safe only for 25 men at one time, do not walk. And so you don't see a security guard here. You don't even see a gate. Uh, that's because the footbridge early on was open to the public and anybody who wanted to come up there could. And then uh, they started to interview people to let uh, see who could come up there. And here we are in 3D. And here we are looking down the footbridge and up the footbridge from Brooklyn. And here we are, regrets. I've had a few, the Sinatra song. Uh, people were allowed up there and not everybody was thankful as they were doing it for having launched themselves onto the footbridge. Uh, one of the veteran workers there said that women, for whatever reason, seemed to... Uh, take better to the footbridge than the men did. And so then the cables, uh, the cables were what would support the bridge. Uh, as I said, they were too massive or would be too massive to uh, create elsewhere and then put them across the towers. That was an impossibility. And so you had to spin them by pulling the wires back and forth. Here's EF Farrington riding across the traveler. So the traveler is a loop of wire that would then in turn pull the other wires, just as you would if you attached a wire to this wire and pulled it across the bridge, uh, you would get the same effect. And so here is the carrier wheel. The uh, former Brooklyn Historical Society has one of these that has survived and you looped the wire. You see the ends of the wire here looping around this and that's what pulled the wire back and forth. Then they had to do a lot of splicing of wires. And the wire shed was on the Brooklyn side. So I can tell from this photograph with that shed up there that this is in fact the Brooklyn side of the anchorage. Here we are looking down towards that shed again up in here. And this is a cutaway. One of the virtues of a drawing is that you can eliminate the building if you want to. And so you see the eight spools at the bottom, which were the wires, and two assigned to each of the ca four cables. Uh, here we see the connection of the anchor chain going down into the anchorage to the strands, uh, which would hold the wires in place. And then ultimately, they, all of this got hidden below the stones that went at the top of the anchorages. So here are just wonderful drawings by Washington Roebling. Uh, kind of musing as an engineer about the best array of the 19 uh, strands. Uh, the Roeblings had never done a 19 strand cable. Uh, and so this was much more ambitious. And so here we see a detail where he's just playing with the idea. Strand number one is going to go here. Uh, strand number two, then three. And, and then you can see he kind of changed his mind up in here. And so changed the sequence and continued to play with this. Uh, this is one of my favorite photographs of the bridge. This is from my uh, personal collection showing the new top of the New York anchorage with the uh, footbridge, with the four cables, uh, with New York in the distance. City Hall would have been right around here. The Tribune building along Park Avenue. 
uh, this post office at the uh, intersection of, uh, excuse me, uh, Park Row and uh, Broadway. And so you see this cable has been uh, wrapped to the extent of having these brackets around it and it would be further wrapped with uh, galvanized uh, zinc wire. And here you see the strands yet to be uh, bracketed together. Uh, at the top of the tower, seeing uh, one of the cables coming across these saddles. Uh, Washington Roebling spent a lot of time, here we are in 3D, on the saddles, uh, wrapping the cables in the winter. This, as I mentioned, is that wire that they used, I think on this bridge for the first time, uh, galvanized zinc to protect the steel. And so one of the developments of the bridge is using steel on the bridge, which had not been done before. Uh, and here we see the approaches being worked upon. Uh, this is a car on this wooden railway that allowed them to move stones and other equipment back and forth. Uh, you see the three basic sections of the bridge. So this is for carriages. This is going to be for the pedestrian uh, promenade and for the railway that's going to run across. And this is the other direction coming from Brooklyn across to Manhattan. So this is a Wilhelm Hildenbrand I mentioned uh, early on, the just wonderful, wonderful drawings that he did uh, from the municipal archives now. And this is a detail of one of those drawings which shows the entire New York approach and stretches on uh, for uh, quite a bit. Uh, here we are in 3D uh, looking at the approaches. Uh, here you see that construction railway again to move materials back and forth. And here's one of those cars. And so what I, I think is one of the strengths of the book is the ability to pull together material that has never been seen together that complements uh, each other. Uh, here's another uh, half stereo view. And you can see here how they are moving this material across these rail, uh, railroads. Uh, and then of course the deck of the bridge that they extended out. You see these men kind of nonchalantly standing up about 200 feet above the East River. And they are extending from the two towers evenly so not to stress the materials. Uh, here you see how they're stretching those steel beams out. And here's how they connected them. So again, the suspender wires dropping down from the cables, being attached to these beams, the beams then being connected in the middle to form one massive beam 85 feet across. And here are the five sections of the bridge. So the carriages, then the railway, then the pedestrian promenade, which had no precedent and was never repeated on any bridge ever again and to me is one of the most magnificent features of the Brooklyn Bridge, the ability to get up there and walk across. And both John and Washington Roebling championed that feature of the bridge uh, for people to come out and get the view and get fresh air. And so here we see a woodcut of the division of the various features of the bridge. And then the railways and terminals, uh, they wanted a mass transit system that would take you from one end of the bridge to the other. And so William Payne, the assistant engineer was a pioneer in the construction of cable cars. He had done uh, Sutter Street uh, out in San Francisco. He had done Denver and Cleveland. And he pioneered the idea of cable cars, which would eliminate the need for a heavy locomotive uh, taxing the ability of the bridge to support weight. And so this is a steam engine that was on the Brooklyn side that drove those cables. And here's the terminal in Brooklyn. Uh, Brooklyn had a bend. Uh, this is from municipal archives and shows a detail of the Brooklyn terminal. And then you see that same element up in here and actually it's interesting to see that it looks to me like this was more uh, involved 
than what they ultimately built up here. The interior of the uh, Brooklyn Terminal, uh, you had a car going in one direction to New York, uh, you had a car coming from New York to Brooklyn, uh, a, a series of cars, so three or four uh, on a cable. And so here we have a wonderful movie from 1899, showing the cable car in operation. The camera is at the front of the cable car and you see the cable right here that is pulling the cars across. Uh, eight, by 1899, they had added these uh, cars also. And then these were removed uh, about 1950 when the automobile was ascendant to create uh, three automobile lanes. And then uh, just September of last year, a separate bike lane was created, taking away one of those cars as bikes are now ascendant. And to me, uh, my favorite element of this bike lane is that it took bikes off of the pedestrian promenade and the pedestrian promenade is as it was originally intended to be uh, exclusively for pedestrians and is still a wonderful, wonderful feature of the Brooklyn Bridge. And so opening day, May 24th, 1883, a grand celebration, hundreds of thousands of people coming into New York uh, the president of the United States, Chester A. Arthur, a New Yorker, walks across the bridge to inaugurate it. He meets Seth Lowe, who is leading the Brooklyn delegation. Uh, Seth Lowe, the only man to be mayor of both Brooklyn and New York City uh, before Brooklyn became a part of New York City. And here you see this uh, signal man here, and he's signaling to the North Atlantic fleet, which has been brought into New York Harbor which then fired uh, salutes as did Governor's Island and the Brooklyn Navy Yard celebrating the opening of the bridge. And so here we are, a union of hearts and a union of hands, the linking of the two cities, the grand celebrations that night, which as I said, were repeated uh, in 1983. And then the bridge still remains very much in the hearts of New Yorkers, as I think you all know, uh, when you wanna advertise the Knicks versus the Nets, the Brooklyn Bridge winds up as a feature of that advertising. And then the bridge as it is the grand bridge today. And so once again, uh, my book, uh, if you've uh, appreciated this presentation, I would hope that you would get a copy of my book and the ability to get your glasses and to see the images in 3D uh, here is uh, the back of the book, which has, uh, let me get this out of the way, a quotation from Kurt Anderson, the author and uh, host of radio. If you love Brooklyn or bridges or New York City or cities or eight, 19th century marvels or all of the above as I do, Building the Brooklyn Bridge is a perfect feast, a would-be time traveler's delight, overflowing with rare and evocative and fascinating images. It's a terrific book. And so I'm very proud of that. I just wanted to conclude oops, with a quotation from Montgomery Schuyler, who was, uh, oops, A critic writing for Harper's Weekly, uh, really uh, many describe him as the first architectural critic in America. Uh, the day the bridge opened, uh, he wrote, it so happens that the work which is likely to be our most durable monument and to convey some knowledge to, of us to the most remote posterity is a work of bare utility, not a shrine, not a fortress, not a palace, but a bridge. And so with that, I will stop sharing the screen and I would hope that you have some wonderful questions to ask and I'm here to answer them. Yes, we have quite a list. So we'll, we'll just jump, jump right in. in. Um, Gregory asks, what is the name of the free software that you use to create 3D images? Ooh. 
Uh, I don't know offhand. Uh, if you uh, search the internet, it should come up. Uh, it's stereo something or other. Stereo, uh, I don't remember. But if you search for uh, anaglyphs and creating stereo views, uh, stereo anaglyphs, uh, you should be able to find it. It's easily uh, found on the internet. Okay, and Patty asks, is that what a stereo, stereopticon was, a viewer for these stereographic images? Yes, yes. So a stereopticon view is kind of the formal terminology. I, as a collector, uh, know that uh, collectors refer to them as stereo views, kind of in a friendly manner. And so in my book, I use the terminology, both terminologies. But yes, it's those side by side, slightly different images taken typically with a camera whose lenses were essentially as far apart as the eyes on a typical uh, human being. And so you got that 3D effect, but from the slightly different images that you then viewed through a uh, viewer with two lenses. The anaglyph that we put in the book eliminates that need and just creates the uh, ability to use these 3D glasses as uh, part of the viewing experience. Thank you. And Selen asks, can we say Bosphorus Bridge in Istanbul, Turkey is a suspension bridge too? If you're familiar with that. That I do not know about. I have not heard of that one. That's a new one for me. I'll have to look into that. Um, Patty asks, um, when did the Washington Bridge collapse? Um, she said she seems to remember seeing a film of that as a child. Yeah, I think that was fairly recent, kind of uh, late 20th century. And so, uh, yeah, there are uh, maybe more mid 20th century. And so there are movies of that. If you just uh, Galloping Gertie. If you uh, Google that, uh, you'll be able to see that uh, online and how it started to gallop. And because, as the Roblings recognized, if you didn't make the bridge rigid, you were begging for problems. And they were very, very conscientious. All of this uh, signage that you see both on the Cincinnati Bridge and the Brooklyn Bridge breaks step. Uh, they didn't want people marching across the opening day. Uh, the seventh regiment band came across the bridge and Washington rolling wanted to make sure that they were not marching in step and creating a rhythmic vibration that might knock his bridge down on opening day. So they were very conscious of that uh, danger. And clearly the bridge people out in the state of Washington were not. Um, Dan asks, are there records of the names of the Brooklyn Bridge workers? Uh, there are, to some extent, there are no uh, rosters that have uh, survived. Uh, industrial projects of the 19th century uh, didn't save that sort of material. And so we don't have that. There is a wonderful website. And so again, if you Google uh, workers and Brooklyn Bridge, a woman in New Jersey has put together a uh, website that discusses nothing but the average worker on the bridge and accounts of their injuries, accounts of their deaths, uh, really wonderful work that she did. and you should be able to easily find that. Right, and Rocco asks, were these illustrations of construction made during the, uh, the construction for the public? Um, and he says he want, he's wondering if Roebling used anything to direct his men or visualize the new pioneering construction. Right, and so uh, the photograph that you saw that I talked about how uh, they hung the stones uh, is I believe by Silas Holmes, who was an important 19th century photographer. 
up at RPI, there are what are clearly reprints of original drawings that Holmes did for the bridge. And that was his opening, I think, to get the kind of Cadillac treatment from the bridge people. And so they were reproducing these to give to the assistant engineers, to give them an idea of what they needed to be doing. And was there another part of that question? No, that is it from Rocco. Um, Fiona asks, is a caisson basically a type of coffer dam? Uh, no, no, because the coffer dam is not descending into the ground. Uh, the caissons of the Brooklyn Bridge were dug into the ground. On the Brooklyn side, they went down about 50 feet. On the Manhattan side, they went down, I think, close to 90 feet. And so they, these are the largest things that had ever been dug into the ground in the history of humanity. And they are digging, digging, digging until they reach the spot where they are on really terra firma. And so on the New York side, because they had to use so much compressed air as they continued to go down, Washington Roebling had a dilemma. And the dilemma was, we haven't hit bedrock. Should we stop now or should we risk more men dying from the bends? And he made an executive decision and said, we're going to stop. We're on sand that is so compact and has not moved for millennia. And so we're just going to stop there. Amazing. Um, Jennifer notes that she didn't see any black workers and wonders why they would not be using the black labor force. Uh, well, I mean, I think we know that there was a history of segregation uh, there were certain jobs open to people of color in the 19th century, uh, sailors, catering, uh, you know, working on the docks, and not a lot of other things. I did find an image that is reproduced in my book uh, of a uh, man of color on the site. Uh, and he's kind of on the corner of the image, and it's unclear whether he is a worker or, or just a passerby, but there is that one image. But I think, you know, they were certainly a product of their time, and so whether uh, they hired any people of color, uh, I don't know. You look at the photographs, you don't see anybody there. And that leads me to believe that they may not have. Yeah. And Nancy says, over all these years, has there been a lot of deterioration of the original materials or has there been much replacement needed? No, no, the Brooklyn Bridge is very good. And so uh, right around 1950, when they were expanding the uh, car lanes, uh, they did a thorough study of the bridge and concluded that it needed a good coat of paint. And uh, I know McCullough's book from 1972, he spoke with uh, the engineers who maintain New York City's bridges. And they told him that of all the bridges in New York City, the Brooklyn Bridge gave them the least trouble. And so I think quite a tribute. And, and it was tremendously overbuilt also. Uh, during the course of the construction of the bridge, they discovered that bad wire had been sold to them despite their best efforts to inspect the wire. And they were not in a position to be able to pull that wire out of there. And so they just continued what they were doing. But the cables were built five to six times stronger than they had to be to perform their function. And Dan asks, are there any records of the homes displaced by the towers or anchorages? anchorages? Yeah. Yes, the bridge, actually, uh, there is a volume report of the trustees of the Brooklyn Bridge, which is a thick 19th century volume. And they have a list of every property that they purchased 
and how much they paid for it. So they clearly were given uh, the uh, eminent domain power to be able to acquire all of this land, you know, one plot at a time uh, from people who owned it along the way of the approach and into the anchorage and the towers. But we do have that we have detailed uh, one lot at a time records of. And you may have just touched upon this, but Elizabeth asked, um, have the cables ever been replaced? No, no, these are the original cables. And so I've been uh, speaking with a professor of engineering and uh, we've been nerding out about the Brooklyn Bridge. And so I specifically asked him and he said that, in fact, if it became necessary, you would spin them much in the manner that they were spun uh, in the 1870s and early 1880s. Uh, the original technique would be uh, pretty much the same, but uh, no necessity of doing that at this point. As I said, steel, uh, first time steel was used for cables and then wrapped with galvanized wire to keep the uh, salt water off of it. And the cables are uh, in good shape all these years later. So, uh, so far so good as my book concludes. Okay, and that brings us to our last question from Christine. How long did it take to research this book? Um, since 1983, she suggests? Uh, actually, before that, I would say so. Uh, I, I have, I read McCullough's book shortly after it came out. Uh, I've read it twice. I've listened to it about seven or eight times on audio at the gym. And so uh, that's been a great source. And I started collecting images as early as 1980. Uh, I collected a uh, original program for the opening of the bridge. These uh, extraordinarily dull speeches that were given an original invitation printed by Tiffany and company. Uh, and so those are now at the uh, Greenwood uh, historic funds collection, but uh, collecting over the years and then probably three years of serious bringing these images together from the three great archives, from the three great photo collections, and then from a extraordinary collection that Richard Haw has of woodcuts illustrations of bridge construction. Okay, thank you. I actually did see another question come in um, from Jennifer. Let me just quickly pull that up. Oh, she asked whether, um, what illness did uh, Washington Roebling suffer and die from? He uh, is quite a phenomenon. So he, uh, as I said, uh, he described himself as an invalid. Uh, I was recently down at the Smithsonian, their uh, natural history museum, and his photograph is on the wall there because he is one of the great collectors of minerals in the history of the United States. And he would send out notes while he was working on the Brooklyn Bridge. I am a humble invalid. Please send me a piece of such and such a stone. So he had gotten the bends. The caisson in Brooklyn had caught fire just before it was to be completed and filled in. And he went into the caisson to fight the fire and was down there for a number of hours. And when he came out, he got the bends and some of the other men got the bends from coming out of the compressed air. Uh, there was no science at the time understanding that if you came out of compressed air, you had to come out slowly. And so that debilitated him. But as I said, he also so worked and worked so hard that he just burnt himself out. And so that was much more of a factor in his inability to leave his home as the work on the bridge continued. So, but he outlived them all. So six, six assistant engineers, all of the trustees on the bridge, and the last of them to die was Washington Roebling in 1926. Uh, he was this little old man. 
who was a feature of Trenton, New Jersey, who went back to work when he was about 81 years old at the wire mill because everybody else had died off. All of his relatives and brothers and nephews who were running the mill. And he went in there and worked a full day, 81, 82, 83 years old, until 86, 1926, he finally died. So the strength of this man is uh, just amazing. Okay, thank you again to author and historian Jeff Richman. I just want to echo some of the comments that have been shared in the chat about what a wonderful and engaging presentation this was. Um, so thank you to everyone who joined us both here and on YouTube. Um, just so you know, we have an event next month. Please consider coming back for that person, place, or thing with Randy Cohen. Our guest speaker will be the health commissioner, Dr. Dave Chokshi, um, speaking about the world and the history of um, pandemics. So please join us next month. Thank you again. Have a good night. And thank you, LaTanya. And thanks to everybody who joined us this evening and to the Missile Archives, of course. Good night now.